Welcome into Eastern Panhandle Talk. My last shift for the week, thank goodness. <laughs> um, we've had a great week. I want to thank you for all putting up with uh, what we did. We are joined today. We're not going to be doing any of those silly introductions that makes makes these guys feel good about themselves. <laughs> We're going to just... It's, it's the cantankerous crew. Uh, the Friday crew is here. I want to welcome Bill Stubblefield. Good morning, Mike. Good Larry good. Schultz. Great to be here. Mike Carl. Good to be with you. Mike Height. Good morning, sir. And on the phone, he may be cantankerous, but he is good looking, <laughs> Mr. Joe Ferretti. Joe, are you there? Um, hang on. Push this button. Joe, are you there? No, I think it's the other button. We gotta find a button for Joe. It's the one on the end, I think. There you go. Joe. Can you hear me Good now? Good morning. <laughs> yes, I can. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> I had to get lessons from height. See, you sit next to Rob all the time. You know exactly what it is. <laughs> well, I presume all five of you watched all six hours of show that was put on by me all week. So uh, I will take all the compliments you can give me all day. Um, but let's kick this off. Uh, let's jump right into it. Joe, why don't you give us our first topic? Okay. Well, first of all, Mike, I'll give you compliments. I thought the discussions this week were, were uh, really substantive. I enjoyed them. So we're going to talk race, the five of us white guys, or six of us white guys, right? We're gonna... No. No. That. Uh, I, I've got a, the first topic I have, Mike, is something that is just kind of bothering me uh, all week when I heard the news. Governor Jim Justice has committed to sending 50... National Guardsmen from the state of West Virginia to Texas to assist with border security. Now, he's not the only governor doing this. There are governors in other states who have uh, made similar commitments from their states. Now, what bothers me about this, uh, a couple things. Number one, uh, clearly reports of late show that there was not this a surge of migrants seeking to cross the border as a lot of people had feared after the expiration of Title 42. In fact, I'm seeing reports that numbers are down 50% or more compared to previous months in terms of the number of folks who are attempting to cross our border. So I, I wonder where the crisis is. Secondly, we are in our own crisis in the state of West Virginia, declared by Governor Justice since August of last year. And the crisis is with our correctional facilities and the fact we don't have enough people working in those facilities. To the extent that the governor has had to use our National Guardsmen and women to man posts in our jails and in our prisons because we don't have the requisite number of people to work there. So while we have a crisis at home that goes unabated and right now it doesn't seem to be uh, the subject of much discussion in Charleston, he's sending National Guardsmen and women to Texas. I see this as a political stunt uh, for somebody who uh, aspires to be our next U.S. Senator. So the question I have for the panel this morning is, is this just another in a long line of the governor's political pandering, political stunts, right up there with showing his dogs behind to everybody in our state legislature, uh, bringing in a plate of cow manure on a, on a plate to, to exhibit some sort of uh, disdain for the actions of our legislature at another time? Is this just another in a long line of stunts? By the governor, and is he worthy of our vote for U.S. Senate, given the rich history that we have in our state about uh, the people we have elected to our U.S. Senate? Is he worthy of that office, or should we start taking a clear and, and, a, and a very sincere look at the makeup of this man, his problems, his baggage, and what he tends to do in, involving uh, uh, the state's resources and pulling off these political stunts. I have my doubts. I'm wondering if others do too. Let's go to my call. Well, I, I generally agree that, that it's in the nature of a political stunt. 
Uh, I don't agree that, that the border crisis is abating. Um, and I think if, if, if we didn't have the problem that you outlined at the, you know, in the, in the uh, incarceration staffing and so forth and, and all the other problems, uh, if, you know, to, to send a signal that we support the protection of the border, I think is, you know, is a positive thing. But it, it, it's, a, it's clearly a political stunt, and it's just one of many reasons to think twice about voting for, for justice for U.S. Senate. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, I find it curious that uh, uh, just uh, not justice, but Abbott sent out letters to most of the governors, especially the Republican governors. Only two states have responded besides West Virginia, Idaho and Florida. I think in Florida's case, it's very obvious that DeSantis is trying to uh, curry for uh, support from the uh, from the right. Uh, the other thing I find curious about it, Joe, is that West Virginia has been asked to pay for it. Uh, generally, something like this, it's the, the receiving state uh, covers the expenses. But in this case, West Virginia is n not only sending the National Guard, but they're paying for the expenses involved. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, I think it's a, a political stunt. I think it's going to, he's going to get a lot of visibility out of it. Uh, mostly, I think, will be supportive of what he's doing. There will be some that will be against it. But I think it's a political stunt. But it's going to cost West Virginia money in both the dollars and the time of the folks that could have been used for other purposes such as corrections. Larry, I think it's a shameful misuse of our National Guardsmen. Um, you're exposing them to an awful lot of danger that doesn't affect this state where they serve. There's another problem, too, besides the incarceration issues that are using guardsmen. Now we send 50 more to the border. You know, one of the things they do remarkably well, and they're the only people who can do it, is help us recover from floods in this state. And I don't know if it was, was it 2016 that we had a massive flooding across the state while then Congressman Mooney uh, left as soon as the flooding hit and went to the Middle East <laughs> for a week or two weeks uh, while those guardsmen went down there and worked their tails off for the people of West Virginia. I really don't see a big threat to West Virginia, even if the border does explode like they claimed it was going to and it didn't. I don't see a big threat to West Virginia from that. And I, I'm absolutely opposed. I, I, if I were a guardsman, I don't know which would be worse. <laughs> serving in a penitentiary or serving on the border. Neither one of which they ought to be doing. Uh, West Virginia needs to pay for its own prison staff and, and not use National Guardsmen, expose them to that danger. And Texas needs to admit for once that they're on the border with Mexico. <laughs> In fact, they used to be Mexico once upon a time. And so, yeah, that's going to be a problem, just like New York has people coming in on boats, and so does California. Um, that's going to be an issue, and it goes with where you are. I mean, what's next? Are we going to go down because it's too hot in the, for the people in Texas and, and have our National Guardsmen bring air conditioners with them? Uh, you know, that's not the job of the National Guard to make things okay in Texas. Michael Height. First of all, I have to be careful as a sitting delegate. I don't want to piss off our governor. Um, having said but that, you will. I will. This was absolutely a political move because he's running for Senate, and this was all just show there's no need for our National Guard to be down at the, at the border. Whether there is an influx of people or not, there is really no reason to send 50 West Virginia Guardsmen down to the border. Now, I will disagree that they could be using the corrections because I think we're using as many Guardsmen in the corrections area as we can right now. But there's only certain, um, only certain duties they can perform uh, in the corrections facilities. And I think they... The, the correction facilities that we've talked to are using as much of the guards as they can. There's, they, they don't need more guardsmen at this point. They need more corrections officers so that they can be around the pop 
population within the, the system. So I don't think we could have used them in those areas, but we didn't have to uh, bring them on to, to active duty and pay them to go to the border either. This was absolutely political pandering. But there's only a finite number of guards, guardsmen anyway, so these folks, if they're working corrections and asking a, a small is, number to do something Which is else. probably why we only sent 50, because we're using yeah. most of them up yeah. in the corrections. I, but, you I, know, guardsmen are paid, most of the salary is paid by the federal government. You know, you got to realize that stuff. So. Yeah. And I need, I stand corrected. We have a colleague that uh, from Charleston, South Carolina, that listens to us on a daily basis. And he says South Carolina is also sending uh, folks to the border. I thought there were only two states, three states. There must be more than that. So. Back to you, Joe, to close. Well, I was just struck by the, the fact that it was the governor who declared a crisis, an emergency in the state of West Virginia back in August of last year. And I don't see much coming out of the governor's office uh, in an attempt to solve that problem. In fact, the last we've heard from Roger Hanshaw and Craig Blair was they're waiting for the governor to come with a proposal about what to do with corrections. Uh, and, and while I might say to Mr. Hanshaw and Blair that, you know, you guys should roll up your sleeves too, uh, the bottom line is <laughs> to have the National Guard here in West Virginia deployed to Texas when we're counting on them to help us with corrections and we're not dealing with the crisis in our own state that is now at, what, month number nine and, and, and or month ten and going on, uh, it seems to me to be uh, a real misuse of state resources. And I think you should be called on it uh, in, in this campaign season coming up. I'm going to push back a little bit, Joe, that, that I believe that the legislature, um, Craig Boyer and Robert or, or Roger Hanshaw, have been rolling up their sleeves. There are discussions about correcting this correctional facilities issue uh, behind the scenes. Those those um, those committees, the, the jails committees, have been meeting on a regular basis about this particular issue, trying to hammer out some kind of consensus agreement to get this pushed through. I think the hang-up is there are some people that just want to throw money at it, um, and there are others that are saying this is a much bigger problem, and we need to to uh, delve into all of the issues with corrections and get it right before we come back and have a bill. Now, I, I am I am 90% sure that sometime this summer, we will be called back into special session to take care of this issue. So I think those things are happening behind the scenes. The, just the general public doesn't see them. Uh, no, that's encouraging. That's good to hear, Mike. All right, moving on. We're going to go to a little different. We're going to go Mr. Call for the second topic. I'm going to bring up something really different, but even for me. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the front page of the Charles Gazette, to which I have a subscription, you know, know that enemy, uh, just a day or so ago, had a report that showed that there's like 350 some counties or in the United States that are, the you know, the poorest based on, you know, some income measurement. And of course, West Virginia had a delegation, which you would expect, you know. But one of them was Montgomery County, which I think has possibly the strongest, you know, or one of the, you know, two or three strongest, you know, local economies in in West Virginia. And and so I, I dug into it, and, and it's it really is based on they they, you know, we have a high enrollment university there and they treat the students just based on their own individual you know not their families but but their own you know uh, they some of them have part-time jobs but they're you know they're obviously low-paying jobs and they treat them as part of, of the, you know the of the community that they measure and that that, that ought to tell you something about not about Montgomery County, but about about the the concept of the the national welfare people and how they measure things. And so I'm just I'm I'm bringing that up. It, obviously, uh, you know, most of the eleven were in in the South, uh, but I, I don't I don't think uh, the the county where Marshall is 
It's uh, Huntington. Huntington. Uh, uh, well, Huntington, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, the county. Yeah. Cabell. But, but Cabell. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think it was listed, you know. It, it, and they, of course, Marshall isn't nearly as big as WVU in terms of, you know, outweighing the, the local population. But but it, it really... Uh, so what's your question to the Well, the, the, the question is, what does that tell us about the, the way that the national welfare uh, agencies... How they rate? How they manage their 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 jobs? It's if they look. if they if they measure, you know, poverty that way, what's it tell you about everything else they're supposed to be doing? Larry Schultz, um, I'd be interested to know whether there's other university towns like Morgantown, where the you know in Kansas or someplace where, where there was where a, there's a, a public a, university, a large university, but yeah. a rel- not not such so, so, so a huge. Uh, um, it, it would be interesting to see whether that tracks. Oh, I, I assume it does. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd be very surprised if Center County, Pennsylvania is on the list. Uh, um, or Penn State. But, yeah. Because it's, you know. <laughs> it's very affluent around there. It is an affluent place. I it, mean, there's just no escaping it. It's um, funny because you guys bring this up, but during during the pandemic, our household or and the households around our area all got the 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 food stamps, if you will, the, the cards because we had kids because we were in a low income because Arden is in a low income area. And that really confused me because they didn't actually look at who needed it. It was just blank, blanket sent out to everybody in but our yeah. area. And to go back to the, you know, the, the issue, well, so what? Look at the incredible inefficiency and wasting of public resources of taxpayer money that when it's based on that kind of thinking. Mike Height. Well, I, I I would agree that this is just a bad study and and, and and a bad way of looking things, and it just goes to prove that there are agencies within our federal government and state government that um, that don't look at things properly and and don't go out our our public dollars properly. Um, and there's a plethora of examples, and this is just one of them. Bill, yeah. I there it's also awful easy to jump on this and, and criticize. I don't know any of the details. I uh, generally a credible study uh, will spell out up front what are the parameters, what are they looking at, and why. Uh, most every study can be criticized from certain perspectives, uh, but the credible studies, which that's why you have peer reviews. Anything that appears in most professional magazines, they are looked at by the colleagues, and if there are difficulties in the procedures or the protocol, they're highlighted. Uh, this, this study very well may have another purpose that is has been misused. I don't know. This is the first time I've heard about it. I, unlike Mike Carl, I've not looked at the, uh, looked into it, so I cannot say what was there or what was not there. Uh, I'm just saying it's a little, uh, it's it's awful easy to throw stones when we don't know anything about a situation other than what we've been been told. So I'm just saying, proceed with caution, be critical. It may deserve all the criticism. I'm not saying it doesn't. It's just that I don't know enough about it to say whether the criticism is warranted or not. Uh, uh, well, I, I first of all, I've lived in Montegalia County. Uh, prior to moving to Berkeley County, and, and granted it was 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago, but even then, Montegalia County was clearly one of the more prosperous counties in the state of West Virginia, and I would rank it up there with about any other community that I've ever lived in, uh, even when I was going to school in, in Western Pennsylvania, uh, going to college. Uh, it, it, I thought Montegalia County had a lot going for it, and, I'm, and judging by the amount of building that's going on over there, both residential in commercial, it seems to be faring fairly well. Uh, so I, I would certainly, as Mike has done, raise some concerns about the underlying data for the study. And, and Mike raises a, an important point. When we are provided with these studies and their conclusions, it does pay to look closely at the underlying methodology, the data used to produce these and publish these studies because uh, it, it, it's, it's all too often we, we just accept that what we're seeing and what we're reading 
is accurate and and well founded. And sometimes, you, if you you know peek behind the curtain, you find that uh, uh, such is not the case. And I, I think clearly, Mike Carl has found a study here that that, that appears to be flawed. Uh, I, again, like Bill suggesting, I, we don't know enough about it, uh, not having looked closely ourselves, but. Still, the message is clear to, to make sure that you are scrutinizing of any information you're provided before you you run off and start indi- uh, touting the fact that uh, Montague County is suffering in West Virginia. Well, I think uh, you got to look at this from another perspective, too, and I think Mike brings up a good point. West Virginia gets ranked low in all these categories, income, things, but when you look at it, you know, say the average income in West Virginia is 48000 The average home price is also a lot less. The, the cost of living is a lot less. There's a lot less real estate tax. So I don't know if they bring those factors in when they, they label us as the poorest or uh, you know, the, the worst at this and the worst at that. There's a lot of factors that go into some of these studies. I would love to see the studies, if any, that are done before we hand out billions of dollars to for-profit corporations in the energy industry and the utilities and all the other areas where this money I are hiring all these people yeah, and, and employing all these people and providing for such communities but, right <laughs> but but still um what is the basis for that it's not the, that they're the poorest i don't think and some, sometimes, so the standard of giving away government money doesn't only seem to be weak with regard to what money poor people get. And I, it's also really weak with regard to what money rich people but get. But investing in communities and in economic development, that's an investment for the future, right? Providing jobs, providing. So I think I agree with you. You don't want to be giving money to poor proper corporations just willy-nilly, but there are instances where it is important and it is going to have a financial benefit to all concerned. Well, well, points, points well taken on both cases, yeah, but yeah. we're also criticized for, uh, for giving money out too quickly. Uh, but if we did the studies like Larry suggests, uh, we could spend all of the time studying, studying, <laughs> studying, and would never get the money out. There's a, there's a balance that's going to be subject to criticism on both sides. People yep. say you gave the money out without the study. Other folks will say you've studied too much. So. I agree. Mike, you got any uh, follow-up on that? I, I, I would just add that, that this, first of all, uh, the Gazette, the, the article was a had a great bit of detail and went into the you know how how this could happen given you know, and but but it 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 clearly shows a system that's that's based you know that the results in the waste of billions of taxpayer dollars that's proven by by this revelation and and the other allegations about you know subsidies to companies and stuff you know that's just a vague you know well pushback when, the, when the, this is proven when the money gets used for stock buybacks it ain't so vague <laughs> well specific, that ain't but specifically what, what 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 are you talking about larry well, the oil industry, for example, gets subsidies. The coal industry gets subsidies. Those companies also, uh, some of them, some of the more successful ones, spend billions of dollars buying back their own stock. That doesn't improve anything except the wealth of the stockholders. It doesn't. And what do the stockholders do with the money? They add to the economy that's what they do it grows the private economy and that's what the that's the only legitimate well, function of the government besides national defense and i think larry you, when you say stockholders I, I think most american people who have pensions or or sure. 401ks they, they are stockholders it's not some guy sitting up in an ivory tower right it, it can be but it can in be most cases Musk. it's millions yeah. of pay, people across the country sure and, and, you know, to the extent those people make profits in the execution of their business, then, of course, uh, that's great. Right. But if we're talking about subsidies bad for poor people, we also have to talk about control of subsidies for rich people. That's my only point here. I would love to see a very similar article uh, detailing 
exactly how they arrive at these decisions. I think everybody here kind of knows that lobbying has a lot to do with who gets subsidies. And campaign okay. donations have to do with who gets subsidies. And so there's, there's plenty of areas to, con to concern ourselves with where every bit as much money is spent. All right. Moving on. We're going to go to you, Larry. Uh, we we got to take our bottom of the air break. I can't see the clock, so. So it's 8.30. You want to sit here? No, I'm just All right. trying to help you. Buddy. We're, we're, we're going to go to Larry. Okay. All right. Uh, or, or we can change change places. No. Go right ahead. Just show your... your <laughs> now I'm being stubborn. As, you're being, <laughs> as He's has. being cantankerous. <laughs> cantankerous. We're yeah. going, we're going ad-free for this hour. I like it. <laughs> as... <laughs> I won't make money anyway, so yeah, we'll yeah, figure yeah. it out. I need some <laughs> subsidies, Larry. All right. Uh, well, the recent recognition by Congress as part of the debt ceiling sham uh, that the Mountain Valley Pipeline is in our national interest, and, of course, a bunch of other um, uh, things they put in that bill, like, for example, uh, suddenly changing the jurisdiction of the federal courts who will hear the disputes against the pipeline. Will that, will all of that in any way help uh, us to get some source of gas uh, for the 23 mile pipeline we built five <laughs> years ago from northern Mor Morgan County across northern Berkeley County, disrupting farmers and landowners the whole way that has never had any actual gas put through it. Um, I, I think they're using it for storage. But will those two things, will one help the other? I presume Mountaineer Gas is a part of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, and therefore maybe there'll be some uh, profits they can use uh, to figure out a way to get some gas to the sand mine in Berkeley Springs. Oh, they can actually do something with the pipeline to nowhere. Bill. Yeah. Uh, you're close to this than I am, Larry, but I, I do not say that the two are related. I thought the problem with the pipeline in the eastern panhandle was being interrupted or impeded, impeded by Maryland. And uh, it was a Maryland jurisdiction and not a national jurisdiction. So I don't think what was passed last night will will go to Maryland and say, you've got to give, open this pipeline up for West Virginia. I don't think they're related. Yeah, what what sort of happened is they built, it'd be like they built Route 522 starting on the bank of the Potomac yeah. River when there wasn't a bridge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, so, I, I, think, you know. I think a more legitimate question would be uh, is that the pipeline that was approved last night, will it be a benefit uh, to West Virginia? Will it be a benefit to the nation as a whole? The argument has been made, and I think fairly persuasively, uh, that uh, we have, we're sitting on this massive amount of natural gas, and there's no convenient way to get it to the ports for distribution uh, without the pipeline. So I think the obvious answer is, yes, it would be a benefit. But I found it to be of interest that one of the most vocal uh, opponents uh, to the pipeline was Tim Kaine out of Virginia. And he said he was going to put an amendment in, which he did yesterday, but has voted down. But Kane voted for the debt reduction uh, over his objection that he did not like the pipeline. The debt increase. I'm sorry? The debt increase. The debt increase. increase. I'm sorry. What did I say? You said reduction. No, I'm sorry. Debt okay. increase. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, the, 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 right. the future, Let's go to Mike. spending yeah. reduction. Yes. Right. Future That's spending reduction. I agree with that. But <laughs> it's still an increase in the, in the debt ceiling. Oh, yeah. Ceiling. The current yes. debt. Yeah. Mike Carl. Well, I, I just think that uh, uh, it's, it's obvious that, that this pipeline is very good for West Virginia and good for the country. And the people who opposed it are just... Uh, you know, climate change crazies as far as I'm concerned. And no, 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 no. Everybody did not oppose the uh, climate change crazies. Well, we, we I, had, that's what I had see. one of our local representatives, uh, uh, Mooney, I don't think is a climate change crazy. And he's well, well, that, uh, okay. I, 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 I agree with that. I, I would, okay. Of all the things I would say about him, that, that, that shouldn't be one of them. <laughs> totally, part, part of it might apply. Totally agree. But West Virginia has this great super efficient energy resource that needs 
to be able to go to market and that the economic benefit that you described you know very well bill uh for west virginia is tremendous and 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 and, and so uh uh our congressman's vote against it, uh, the the overall bill not against that per se uh is was a problem and and his his you know southern district of west virginia counterpart miller vote, voted voted for it i mean not uh, of course, both senators did. So I want to tell you something about whether it's good for West Virginia or not. Joe? Uh, well, over this past the Memorial Day weekend, I spent some wonderful days and evenings fishing the beautiful and clean streams and rivers of West Virginia. One of the reasons why a lot of people move to our state and, and cherish our state is, is the outdoor pursuits that we can engage in because we have, despite decades of coal mining in the state, we have managed to somehow keep our streams productive for trout and other fish that we like to uh, pursue. And I enjoy that sport tremendously. Uh, so I welcome the regulatory scheme that was in place to analyze the environmental impact of putting a pipeline through our mountains, which creates a lot of runoff, which runs into our streams and kills the aquatic life in our streams. I welcomed that kind of scrutiny because I think it's important. It's what our state offers to the rest of the nation, and it should be protected and it should be cherished. So I was in support of all that. Having said that now, the core challenges to the Mountain Valley Pipeline have been going on for almost seven years. I think it's fair to say that despite my misgivings about the threats to the environment, that the environmentalists have had their day in court. They've had their opportunity to have this uh, pipeline properly vetted and to ensure that those who are working on the pipeline do follow uh, the mitigation efforts that are necessary to protect our streams. So having had their day in court, I think it was time for somebody to finally say, hey, enough is enough. We've, we've examined this closely enough. We have enough to go by because a lot of this pipeline has already been laid. So let's proceed and get it done. And uh, so I was of the mindset that the environmentalists had their chance, uh, they had their say, and it's time to get this project completed. And I, I, I applaud the completion of the pipeline. I think it will benefit the state of West Virginia. Uh, I understand where Senator Tim Kaine is coming from uh, because it goes through his state too, and they have streams and rivers they're trying to protect in that southwest corner of Virginia where the pipeline is going to run. Uh, but really, folks, we, this has been through the courts time and again. There's been multiple appeals, and it was time to get moving on it. So I, I think it was a, a worthwhile endeavor for Congress to take a close look at it. And I think our senators, Manchin and Capito, uh, should be uh, applauded for their efforts to get this finally done. So... Uh I think to answer Larry's question, I don't think one pipeline has really anything to do with the other one. I think there are federal holdups. I know the the one where you were alluding to that there are Maryland issues and Maryland's holding up a lot. But I think there are two different pipelines, well. correct? Absolutely, well, two absolutely different pipelines. Different. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but the passing of this one, I don't think really affects um, getting the other one passed. What I see a lot of times with these pipelines is they are sort of held hostage to buy a vote. And that's exactly what happened this time, that something big came up in Washington that votes needed to be bought um, from Republican and, and Democratic uh, individuals on the Senate and, and congressional side, and that the pipeline is what was used to get those votes, that, that the EPA clears the road of all these obstacles in exchange for these votes. Now, we only had one particular individual who didn't vote for it, but you, you had three of the others that did. So, and is this, I, 
is this Joe Manchin like, hey, you kind of screwed me over the last time. I want this pipeline no, back. I, is, I, is the, I think that's you want my vote? I, I think that's absolutely part uh, of it because I, he yeah. was promised this once before. And I think that, that the, the pipeline that Larry elite alludes to, that that will be held hostage until they need a vote again. And, and somebody from West Virginia comes and says, well, if I get this pipeline, continue to cross the Maryland, then then I, you'll get my vote again. And I think that happens way too often in, in D.C. I think you're, uh, you're uh, underselling Joe Manchin. He's been a champion of this pipeline oh, right, yeah. for several, several years. So he's, his vote was not held hostage for that particular one. I yeah. think he held his, his vote hostage. He said, if you want to do this, I well, want my pipeline back. Well, he did in that regard, but he initiated it. But, uh, but I don't think that uh, it's something new for Joe Manchin. He's no, no, no. He, this he's wanted years. this all along. Long, but I think this was pandering to his vote from the federal government saying, all right, we need this. From the executive Joe, branch, right? Joe, this is, we're, we're going to give you something in exchange. And, and this pipeline is natural gas, correct? Yes, yes, it, is. yes, yes, yes. it is. So, and you know, let me pick up on something that Joe Ferretti mentioned earlier uh, about the, um, uh, the regulations. And I'm going to say this knowing fully well that my buddy Mike Carl is going to be coming out of his seat right now. But a pipeline is not a pipeline. At least a product that's carrying through is not the same. Natural gas is not very corrosive. And so there is less environmental risk of a pipeline than what the crude coming from the uh, uh, northern... Uh, Western Canada going through the uh, the wetlands in South Dakota. That material is very, very sure. corrosive, and you have all sorts of problems. So there's less environmental risk with what has been proposed for the West Virginia pipeline than what we had in the Midwest. I'd, I'd also like to say I, th I find it hypocritical of, of Tim Kaine to make the, the assertions that he's made when this pipeline is going to go I to agree. a major hub yeah. in in southern, southwestern Virginia where there's all kinds kinds of pipelines coming exactly. together. Yeah. I think you know from from what I know dealing with the delegates down um, in the oil and gas industry down in West Virginia we are sitting on so much and we just don't have efficient ways to get our gas out and this is going to really help West Virginia and you know it's going to help Berkeley County because we get severance tax too so mm -hmm. I, I uh, it's going to help every county. I was shocked 5 years ago that they didn't line up the source of gas before they spent the millions and millions of dollars building the pipeline. And I presume the people in charge of the Mountain Valley pipeline are quite a bit more astute and have their Well, plan. everything was so about the one until, in the yeah. Was it yeah. about the one in the Eastern Panel? Yes. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they told us jobs, 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 and they built. They spent millions and millions of dollars building a 23 mile pipeline, disrupted a whole bunch of farms, and they got no gas. Well, then somebody sued them and stopped it, right? Well, that, no, that's what happened. It was Larry Hogan and Maryland. the Maryland yeah. Public Service Commission said, "We we have karstiology here. We're not going to take all the risk of an environmental disaster for none of the profit. So no thanks." They couldn't cut it and, and they couldn't there was no there was no real and it, it's amazing me every day I say every time I think about it I get it riled up all over again how could you say okay we're gonna spend millions and millions but we're not going to confirm until after we've done that that the gas is going to come through um, it would be like on a much bigger scale if they built the Mountain Valley Pipeline and then they found out, oh, 10 miles away, there's all kinds of gas, but we can't get it there for some reason. <laughs> you you kind of want to line that up ahead of time. It's like, you know, you don't leave for Florida knowing that all the gas stations are closed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Unless you're Bill, he just needs a plug. That's true. <laughs> exactly right. Charge ahead of time, you can get, all, you can get there. All right. <laughs> Couple of North plants between here in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to Mr. Height. All right, let me open up my thing here. All right, so I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, the the federal um, issues and say Manchin has aligned himself with the GOP in these de debt negotiations, and not just the the debt ceiling, but also with um, uh, the the debt. Uh, elimination, student debt elimination um, vote, he has aligned himself with the GOP on that as well. And I'm just wondering, is this a smart move 
ahead of the elections where he's obviously going to run for something. Joe, why don't you start off? Well, I, I can understand, Mike, what uh, Senator Manchin's doing here. He's trying to uh, establish a center in our, our politics, in our Congress, and, and perhaps in the country. Uh, and, and, and if we look at these debt negotiations that took place, uh, and you look at the vote that took place in both the House and the Senate, you could argue that a center has emerged uh, with regard to raising the debt ceiling, at least, and some of the other issues that were uh, included in that bill, which, by the way, also, as we're talking about this pipeline, I believe some permitting reform generally was included in the uh, debt raising bill. So debt ceiling bill. So I, I you know, there's there's an effort here by Senator Manchin, I believe, to establish some sort of middle in Congress and have that translate across party lines to other political arenas where we have work to do, such as immigration, such as tax policy, such, such as our national policy towards Ukraine, towards China, towards AI. Uh, there's a lot of things that we need to tackle here that are really important issues of the day. And I think the goal of Senator Manchin is to establish a middle and perhaps to build upon what we saw with the voting in the last few days on this debt ceiling bill, that the, a, a middle is possible in Congress, that a lot of people still seem inclined to want to get things done and not run to their political corners and just fight over things. So perhaps he's on to something. I don't know yet. A lot has to still materialize. But this is perhaps a start of establishing a political middle in the country that yearns to accomplish things. And whether he's capable of, of leading that kind of movement, uh, it remains to be seen. But perhaps the opportunity's there. And so with his positions on student loans and this pipeline and permitting reform and perhaps some, some other issues coming up, uh, he might see this as an opportunity. And he's going to have to grab it because, as recent polling shows, He's in trouble in our state. I think he realizes that. So uh, while this might be a Hail Mary pass, uh, I think it's something he has to do if he wants to be politically viable going forward. I think it's difficult to uh, – I think we frequently try to uh, dissect every decision a politician makes and then says, is he, is he gearing himself for the next step? Is he pandering to a certain group? Uh, I, that may be true with Manchin. Uh, however, I think Manchin is a, uh, is a man of principle, and he's been sticking by his principles in most every decision he's made. Uh, I think that um, uh, Joe Ferretti is exactly right, uh, that Manchin tends to gravitate toward the middle ground, uh, which unfortunately we do not have enough folks on both sides of the aisle gravitating toward the middle. They they become entrenched in their their party doctrine. They've drunk the proverbial uh, Kool Aid, and they see everything in terms of their party. Manchin is an exception to that. He tends to break with the norms. He tends to look toward the middle. I also think that Manchin is being recognized as a leader in this. We the pendulum has shifted from being a, a mostly moderates to now to the extreme, and there is a, a an urge, a desire to move back to the to the middle on a lot of issues. Manchin appears to be the champion for doing this. Bill, don't you think this also puts him in a position to to actually make a a run on the Democratic side for for president? I well, mean, he's a yeah. He's I'm been to, in the news for years now. Yeah, I'm going to uh, yeah. On my issue, I'm going to address that in part. Okay. But but in that, uh, I think it depends so much on what Joe Biden does. Right now, Biden said that he's going to uh, he's going to run again. There has been a tendency, not a tendency. It's been kind of the. Uh, uh, 
agreement on both parties that you would not, a candidate of credible statute will not take on an incumbent. Uh, once the incumbent says they're going to run, all the candidates of, of reasonable statute have stayed away and waiting for the next cycle. Um, I think if if Biden continues to say he's going to run, I think they'll hold true with the Democrats right now. Uh, if there's an opening, though, I do think that Manchin will, will could jump in, uh, and I think he could be reasonable, uh, reasonable candidate because of his moderate position. Uh, but I, I'd be surprised if he jumps in head to head and challenges Biden. Uh, one, I think it'd be suicidal. I don't think he'd have a chance. Just the two of them. Michael, well, I, I agree with virtually everything I've heard so far about this. Uh, but you know, just keep in mind. Uh, the Democratic, the National Democratic Party has moved away from where it was when when Manson, you know, arose as governor and senator. Uh, and at the same time, his home state has moved the opposite direction. So so it, it, it makes sense for him to to be trying to, you know, play this role that that's been so so well described. So so I. I It'll be interesting. The, the 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 question about Biden's you know candidacy will, I mean he he, he fell over a, a bag just yesterday at the Air Force Academy. So uh, it's it's a wild situation, Larry. Um, first of all, to go back to Joe's original point, we should keep in mind that as we hope for the emergence of a center that the entire debt ceiling thing is just a made-up thing where every once in a while you threaten the whole country with a with a depression <laughs> and this is not regular policy making what they were doing this is needing this idea of raising the debt ceiling and oh we can hold them hostage if we bounce that budget case, we wouldn't have to raise the debt ceiling <laughs> right that's the right. issue well the we, last we, guy who did that as we spoke yeah. about was a democrat so uh, uh you know but i'm still waiting for but, donald trump and ronald reagan to balance one but with a republican house yeah, as you're under Newt Gingrich, says, so is uh, Clinton gets the credit, but Newt Gingrich should get well. They worked together by they worked exactly right. right. I mean, we they did. Trump had right. all houses and still didn't do. But what I started to say is, a center emerged in this dispute because not agreeing was such a devastating blow. We don't have that sort of devastating blow every time we need a center in our politics, and I'm afraid that as soon as the debt ceiling stuff goes away, so will the center that we just saw. And then everybody goes back to tilling their own garden. Um, I think I think Joe gives um, Senator Manchin more credit than what he deserves. I don't think any uh, uh, anybody running... Um, Joe Ferretti. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. any, anybody running um, for public office um, in an upcoming election doesn't think about every decision they make and how it affects that election. Um, I have said openly for a while now that I think Joe Manchin may get into the presidential race. Um, however, this particular vote, I think, lends itself more to the senatorial race. That I think he was, if you look at this from a political advantage, this vote secures West Virginia votes. This this doesn't help him in a presidential race because he would need Democrat votes um, and from the far left as well. So I don't think this votes helps him at all from a presidential perspective, but it does much more from a senatorial perspective. That's a very good point. I think so. Joe, any follow up? Well, yeah, I think I, that's a valid point. Uh, but I, I also think, though, there, there's a wide swath of, of this country that really wants Congress, wants our government to get things done. And uh, more and more folks are becoming uh, upset with the political bickering and fighting that takes place so over sometimes trivial issues rather than, than really taking on the important issues of the country. And I, I, 
I'm wondering, yeah, while I'm sure Senator Manchin still has his eyes cast back towards West Virginia and, and, and this looming Senate race in 2024, uh, there's also an opportunity here, uh, whether he sees it or not, to, to perhaps develop some sort of middle in Congress. I was just struck by the voting that took place on this uh, debt ceiling bill uh, that you know both Republicans and Democrats lined up to get this passed. Uh, and, and Speaker McCarthy was, you know, his his butt was on the line here. Uh, with with some of the factions that he's dealing with in the House uh, about this, uh, how this bill was crafted and what uh, give and take took place. So I, I, I just think that, you know, there, if it's not Manchin, it's somebody else that could perhaps look at this and say, this is political opportunism staring me in the face here in terms of representing a middle in this country that really is... Um, designed to accomplish things and i hope that uh, somebody picks up the mantle if it's not senator manchin but yeah i i agree mike i think it's, it's valid to say that you know you could simply look at this and say he's yeah he, he wants to be viable yet in west virginia and he's going to run and he's going to try to beat either mooney or justice and uh, and this was important for him to do for the state of west virginia but uh i i, I can't get over the fact that he has some national uh play here and he he certainly has people in his ear uh the no labels group is, is looking for somebody to to run they're actively trying to get on the ballot in all 50 states and he might be their man so it, it'll be interesting to see how that develops going forward all right and before we get to bill stubblefoot we are going to take our halfway break here it's uh almost nine o'clock uh thanks for joining eastern pan and talk this Segment brought to you by the Berkeley County Health Department. Get your free rate on test kit. Just mention Mike Hornby today. Uh, we're going to take a break. And welcome back to Eastern Panel Talk with Mike Hornby. Filling in for Rob Mario for the last time, uh, hopefully this year. But uh, knowing Rob, he's going to want another vacation. I am joined by the, the regular <laughs> cantankerous crew, Mr. Height, Mr. Carl, Mr. Stubblefield, Mr. Schultz, and Mr. Ferretti. Now, you, Mike, you've agreed, you grouped us as one cantankerous crew. One cantankerous but crew. among this, there has to be averages. One has to be more cantankerous than others. Well, don't we, Mike Height? I would think so, yes. <laughs> Mike Height is the leader of cantankerous I is I used to, <laughs> I, I'm tired of making fun of Mike. Yeah, we've been friends for a long time, yeah. and, and the first time we played golf, he, he twisted his ankle and almost broke a knee. Um, I used to make fun of him for wearing his readers and having bad knees. But the longer I get to know him, the more I become like him. So I, I, I am joining the cantankerous is, is crew. Is Berkeley County big enough? Uh, I'm just, I, I'm turning into Mr. Height. And it, well, it you, seems, you certainly do him a favor when you injure yourself with tools he's loaned you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the thing is, he, he did say, what do you know about reciprocating saws and, and, and he, he basically willed it on me <laughs> so. all right we're going to kick off this hour with mr stubblefield yeah joe ferretti alluded to this a few minutes ago and that's a third party uh we've mentioned third party in passing uh several times in the show uh it was mentioned yesterday in your discussion with john gilstrap and matt harvey and invariably it's dismissed as it's not going to happen. It's never happened. It will not happen. Ross Perot got 19% uh, of the votes, and that's a, that's a high water mark. It will never happen. I'm going to pose the group, opposed uh, to the group, could this be a different time? And let me set the stage first. Uh, in times past, uh, the, uh, uh, the third parties have been personality driven. By that I mean a uh, uh, George Wallace, a very bigger than life personality, uh, Ross Perot, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, all of these, that was the driver of the party. Uh, they also had difficulty, I mean third party movement, they had difficulty in getting on the state ballots as uneven they got on certain ballots ballots were unable to get on others and uh, and also they were base they were generally uh, personally financed as certainly the case of Ross Perot uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt to a lesser degree so 
and said there's been even number recently uh ron paul got three hundredths of a percent in 2008 strom thurman 1948 got two percent ralph nader in 2003 percent george wallace 14 percent 1968 ross perot got 18 percent in 1992 and and uh even theodore roosevelt 29 percent but there has been a history of a third party being elected for president. Anybody want to harbor Let's go with Mr. Height to start yeah. with. I have no idea who okay. was. Okay. It was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln ran as a third party. In, uh, middle in those in the uh, 19, uh, 1860s, it, the parties were not as well developed. The, okay. the Whig Party was kind of been in dominance. It was falling out of uh, out of uh, favor. Same thing with the American Party. There were several parties that there. So it kind of a mishmash. So it's yeah, not, nothing was established yet, right? Yeah, not right. none of them. But but the uh, the Republican Party uh, that uh, that uh, Lincoln Lincoln ran on was established six years before, and it was still in infancy. So, it, it, in one sense, Lincoln was a third-party candidate. Let me make an argument before I go why this might be an exception. Uh, and I don't th and I think it's a mistake to throw away, throw out the candidacy of a third party at this stage without looking more deeply at it. One, uh, the this uh, no party group is doing a lot of things I think right. One, they are getting on all the battle uh, on the state ballots, especially the battleground states. Uh, they have not yet selected who their candidate's going to be. Uh, Joe Manchin has been uh, been mentioned as long as Larry Hogan and several others, but the no parties evidently is doing a thorough analysis of, uh, of each one of the candidates of how viable they would be, especially individual <coughs> and matched. You'll probably see one pro-life, one uh, uh, pro-choice matched up that way. So my point is ideology will probably be merged together on this, this party, whoever the candidates will be. Uh, and the candidates will be selected downstream. They have not been selected yet. No party has also said that they will look, take a hard look uh, and see if there is a clear-cut path to victory before they actually launch a, an official can, candidate. So, in other words, if they see that there's no clear uh, clear path to victory, you'll not see a no party candidate. But if you do see a no party candidate, they have made the assessment they have at least a reasonable chance. Uh, they built up a pretty good cash reserve. Uh, the other big issue, I think, is the unpopularity of the two front runners, Biden and Trump. It's over 70% of the people are looking for somebody else. Uh, so that'd be another reason. And the third, re the last reason is the social media influence. Uh, the social media, you can introduce yourself to a candidate much easier. So my question after developing it, uh, which I thought was uh, necessary, Mike, uh, uh, my question is, is it a mistake to dismiss the possibility of a third party candidate as casual as what we tend to do? Michael. Well, sure. I, I think it's a mistake, too, because I think there is a, a national appetite for um, a, a third party. Um, but. I look at it as if do they have a viable candidate and I don't see a viable can and I think that's what it would take for a, a third party to get elected in this particular cycle is there would have to be a larger than life type individual. I don't think Joe Manchin is that person on a national stage right now. Um, I, I think within his party he could win, but not as a third party candidate. Um, I, I think you would need somebody probably outside of politics right now, somebody uh, like an Elon Musk or a Mark Cuban or something like that that could come in and rally that centrist group that you're talking about. Um, and I don't see that person emerging at least yet. I think for a third party to become uh, viable, they, they're going to have to do it over years. It will have to be over many cycles. They will have to develop um, downstream before they become a, a viable presidential uh, uh, party. 
uh, per se. So I, I don't see that happening this cycle, but it, it, it's it's a good time to start one. Mike Cole. Well, uh, first of all, the, it, it is important to get to clear through all the structural hurdles, you know, the uh, because the two major parties are built into the system in a you know in a in a legal way <laughs> not not just a you know, presumptive way but but i i i think i think we may <clears throat> you know be seeing that and uh, or a movement in that direction and not so much about a you know a, a charismatic individual but the fact that the extremes at each end are becoming so extreme and social media just leverages their extremity that it's pushing more and more, tens of millions more people to the middle and it's just a matter of having a coherent middle that that people can identify with larry yeah one way in which this could happen i don't know uh exactly what form it would take but one way this could happen is if the Republican nominee, let's say, oh, Donald Trump, gets sentenced to prison. <laughs> you and you have to go there, don't well, you? <laughs> uh, I think we have to go there whether we want to or not. It will <laughs> never happen. And if he goes to happen. prison, then the Republican Party is going to be saying he, he's our presumptive nominee or he may even already be our nominee. Now what do we do? And that would really encourage the No Labels Party to get somebody up there whose name is recognizable already, who people know uh, at least enough about. And then you could see a third, a third, a third. I mean, you, you could actually see a party, uh, a system where nobody has even remotely close to either the number of electoral votes or uh, the popular vote to win the race. And so... Yeah, I mean, at the, it, you know, the Whig Party, as you said, uh, fell apart. I'm not a historian. I can't tell you why they fell apart. But when the main political movement of a particular party is run by a guy who goes to prison for things he did when he was president, then there's a chance that a third party could arise and beat them or split the vote so that he wins. Well, you're assuming uh, that all so. the Trump votes would actually go to the middle, and I don't think I think they would just revert back to whoever the GOP nominee is at that point. Sure, uh, and but, well, but I'm saying the GOP nominee could be the guy in jail. I, I, there's nothing to stop them from that. making him the nominee, yeah. and there's nothing to stop the DOJ from putting him in jail because he's the nominee. Never going to happen, Joe. Joe Ferretti. Well, I, first let's start with a Gallup poll that was conducted back in March, which reveals that 49% of Americans now identify themselves as politically independent. I don't, now we understand that a lot of independents lean one way or the other, Republican or Democrat, but I think what the polling shows that there is a hesitancy on the part of many Americans to identify themselves publicly as a Republican or Democrat because of the disgust we have for the behavior of the parties. Bill's right. Uh, out of 330 million people in this country, we ha apparently are lining up the two guys where we can say it's possible that they could lose to the other. Uh, and, and it's just remarkable that that might be our choice in another year. So the disgust level will be high there, uh, which would seemingly support an independent candidacy. The second area of disgust that I see that's going to develop and be actually uh, raised to an art form is the kind of politicking that's going to be taking place with the two political parties. The use of AI. And the fact that we can generate images and videos that are impossible to determine the validity of, uh, these parties are going to run amok with a campaign that is full of half-truths and myth-truths to the point where we don't know what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what's real, what's fake. And I think the disgust level is going to be ratcheted up 
another notch or two with the general public to the point where they hold these parties in such disdain that they're not only embarrassed to say whether they're Republican or Democrat, they're going to run to somewhere or someone else. Who that person is, I don't know who could head an independent ticket. Oftentimes we hear people mentioned like William McRaven, who was, and, and Bill, you, Stubblefield, you probably know more about McRaven than any of us do since he was a, a four-star in the Navy. Yeah. But uh, the point is that, you know, it's going to take somebody like that who can possibly take the lead of an independent party and have some viability going forward. But I think the momentum will continue to build because of the level of disgust that we currently have for the behavior of the two parties presently. Yeah, and I, I agree with you, Joe. Uh, going back to Mike Height, and uh, Mike used an argument that is frequently used that we need to have someone larger than life. Uh, we tend to forget that uh, uh, Trump in 2016 was not that individual. He became that individual now because and as he became uh, more and more well known. There is a, uh, uh, I think the way the third party is going, to, going about this is to run a lot of potential candidates and finding the individuals that would be the most appealing, the ones that would be the greatest likelihood, and they would be the ones that will be proposed. You don't think Trump was a larger than life name way before he Coming down the president? elevator? Well, I mean, yeah, he was uh, a so TV the ones star. that watch some of his his shows, fine, but the ones of us that do not know, I you do had not heard, know. You had heard of Donald Trump. Only, only from his As necktie. A business type only the necktie that I wore. Come on, Bill. <laughs> All the stuff you he spent too Trump much time on the boat. Towers, yeah. And he had his own TV show. <laughs> yeah. He was a national <laughs> to, a, to a certain sector, Mike. But I don't think to the general oh. public he was not that much. Uh, I think that's the reason wow. he got elected. I think you're mistaken. Uh, I, I think that everybody thought he was a huge name. Yeah, yeah, I, he got yeah. elected because he had this massive uh, 17. Uh, opponents on the platform with him, and he happened to get a well. No, no, no. he beat Hillary too. So, uh, and I mean, that was that was in the general though. That yeah, was by yeah, the primary to get there. So. I don't. I don't know that he could have won as a third party. No. I, I just well, don't. but the point is, Mike. We we tend to dismiss maybe in that election. We we tend to dismiss that nobody can be elected third party because of this this this. The litany of, of the reasons tend to grow and to be changed. My point is there are a lot of things different going into 2024, and Joe Ferretti uh, articulated better than I did, uh, going into 2024 that we have not faced before. So I, I think we we got to be very casual by saying it's got to be the only person who can win is a larger-than-life candidate. I think the mechanism the uh, mechanism put into place that someone other than larger than life could win. I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I just there's there's most of us here in this room are old enough to remember Ross Perot, and many of us who, who voted for Ross Perot may feel like that vote was wasted, and and. Because they voted for Ross Perot, you allowed a, a President Clinton Bill instead Clinton. of That's right. instead of a second term of of uh, Bush. George W. Bush. So, That's right. Yeah, but also and they Ross, don't want to make that mistake again. Yeah, but Ross Perot fell in that category that I described earlier was personality driven. He did not. It was not ideologically driven. It was a personality driven. I think we we dismiss or or don't realize how big the machines are on, on both parties. There's a lot of money on the Republican and Democratic uh, c committees that get run into that. I have a question for the panel for you guys. I know I didn't send this out to you, but don't you think in American politics, the way we vote in our primaries with Iowa first, and don't you think that's how it affects? Because as West Virginians, we'll never get to actually pick a candidate that we like. Don't you think all the primaries should be all all the same day? I've argued all the that same point time? all along that the West Virginia hasn't picked a president in years and years and years because by the time our primary gets around, <clears throat> the presidential nominees are already locked in. It doesn't matter who you vote for in, in West Virginia at that point because the nominees are already chosen. And we've already decided by the like three small three or four small states that that elect um, 
you know, their candidate, oh, well, that's the presumptive nominee, and, and we move forward. Where, you know, Florida, California, Texas, these huge states don't really get a say either. I think it's Super Tuesday. By the time you get to Super mm -hmm. Tuesday, most of the time the candidates have been chosen. So you have Iowa, you have New Hampshire, but once you move down to Super Tuesday and you start seeing <coughs> South Carolina and some of these bigger states with, with bigger electorates, um, once that election happens, I think most of the time the nominee has been chosen and all the other ones are starting to fall in line and, and, and get out of the race or, <coughs> or now start lining up behind the present presumptive nominee and West Virginia hasn't even begun to vote at that point. So but, and we, that's we how, have no voice. And that's how an independent or a third party or somebody else could get elected if, if we had them much closer together. Well, but see, we keep, uh, South Carolina now is going to be the lead off for the Democrats. Iowa is going to continue the caucus for the Republicans, but it shifted from Iowa to, the, uh, to South Carolina for the Democrats just for that reason. Well, and, and it's interesting that it did that because, if you'll recall, during Biden's election, there was still a great deal of doubt until Jim Clyburn delivered South Carolina for Joe Biden. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Joe I, Biden's not forgetting that. I've always wondered why Clyburn. that was so important. Everybody else dropped out of the race yes. because of one person's decision? Well, it was <laughs> the people of South Carolina, and, the, and the, it was a... Well, but the reason they dropped out of the race. Yeah. Well, the reason they dropped out of the race is if Joe Biden can win South Carolina, then what am I doing here? <laughs> there are two that was kind of what it was. Two other things contributed. Uh, Claiborne made his. Amy Kobachard realized that because of the Floyd George Floyd, she could not be elected. She immediately dropped out and she backed Biden. Same thing with a uh, uh, Bill Judge. He uh, he realized he could not win, so he dropped out and backed uh, Biden as well. So these three things coming together at the same right. time push. Push by know the top. Joe and Freddy? plus the fact they were afraid of Bernie Sanders. They did right. not want Bernie Sanders. To I think that's more of the, the case is nobody wanted Bernie. Joe? Well, the, the case against the national primary, Mike, is is the, the political parties don't want that because it's too expensive to, uh, to basically to run the national race. two national elections. They, they'd rather go state by state or have just a few states in play at, at a given time so they can devote resources and efficiently and, and target certain states for, for their efforts to, you know, get their candidate to the top. So I, I think the political parties have been an impediment to having some kind of national primary. They like the system the way it is. Now, the, the jockeying that's taking place, and, and we saw it last time, and it's going to happen again, as uh, Bill mentioned, with the Democrats choosing South Carolina to be number one. You know, for years, Iowa and New Hampshire have had an outsized influence on presidential politics because they were the first caucus and primary conducted in the country. Uh, and that, that's always been a, a problem, I think, nationally in terms of our presidential politics. And I, it, you can see the jockeying that's going to continue as states kind of move their dates uh, for primaries. But West Virginia, you're right. It's, it's so what stops West place. Virginia from, from moving up into right after Iowa and New Hampshire? But I have a good question. I don't think there's anything that stops us, but we... Who makes that decision? Is that the legislature? Well, that needs to be well, done. Well, it's certain states, such as New Hampshire, has written in their constitution, or at least statute, maybe yeah. statute, that they have to be within the top two or three. Right. So if West Virginia moved up... Even that if we moved up right behind New, New, uh, New Hampshire would move even farther right. ahead. So pretty soon would have okay. the... Primaries uh, in January. Or, yeah, 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 or before, in previous yeah. July, yeah. Well, you could move <coughs> up and not have to move up ahead of New you Hampshire. Could, you, you could, you could. And, Just and so we're a part of the conversation. Be, right, so we could still be relevant. And, yeah. and not only that, but look at the economic boon to those states because everybody flocks to those states yeah, because of dollars. elections. But Mike, every other state is saying the same thing. Sure. And if you and the, if you start the process, you could have this mega, mega, mega uh, election day, such as Super Tuesday. But that would not serve us well. There's no way all the candidates could get out <coughs> to every state for a single primary day. And so the big states would get the attention. West Virginia get even would less be ignored, attention. Would be ignored they anyway. managed to do it for the general. But, yeah, but look at the amount of time that had gone into it prior to the general. All the election basically is done in the primary as a jockeying back and forth. The general doesn't, uh, everybody votes the same day. Is so, our, well, 
Is our small amount of electoral votes what stops us from being relevant? It's a certainly contributor, right? Because yeah. you're, you're buying so, electoral votes, and, essentially. And no, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I wouldn't call New Hampshire and Iowa actually no. big metropolitan states either. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and part of it is, I think, both parties like to have kind of out-of-the-way places. Practice where some of their guys who aren't quite ready for prime time can make some mistakes in Iowa and New Hampshire, not repeat them, and still have a shot at the nomination. Um, if you make a mistake in New York, or Florida, or California, or Texas, or some other giant state, it's monumental. It's, it's written you know, on your gravestone. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know. All right. Well, it looks like we kind of went through that one pretty good. I think uh, we're going to take a, our halftime break this time, since Mike Height did not remind me. Um, <laughs> we're going to take a break, and we'll see you on the other side. And welcome back to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Mike Hornby. This is my last segment. I can't wait to sleep in tomorrow, sleep in on Monday, have my coffee and watch, uh, watch the show, get back to normal. Um, so recently... Um, I guess the next topic we can bring up, uh, we kind of were talking about this in the break, is the Supreme Court um, justice in West Virginia stepping down, resigning. Um, I guess my question or our question to you guys is who do you think would be a good fill or who do you think will run for those spots? And we'll start with Larry since you're the... Uh, judge in the room yeah well or the <laughs> lawyer in the room is that one a, of them one, it, of, one yeah. of them are you is that something you would run for no no i have to have a side okay <laughs> i'm the worst guy for that so I'd you would not be a good judge, judge because you've already I, decided I, I, well it's not so much <laughs> i've already decided but i would decide as i go and then if it's a jury trial you don't really have the power to uh, to do to decide, you know, in a, in a trial uh, situation, they're going to make the ultimate determination, and you know, you, what you kind find of, what kind of lawyer would make the best judge in your? Is it is it from the prosecuting side, from the defense, or from business? What does it make? A I difference? may be alone in this, but as far as circuit judges go, okay, my view is the most important quality is temperament. Not judicial scholarship or ability to, uh, you know, fine, cut the fine hairs. That's really in a trial court judge's job. That's the job of the lawyers. And if your lawyer can't cut the, cut the hairs fine enough to make it plain, then you're going to lose the case. I mean, the judge tries to do their best. But to me, the most important thing is that demeanor. Yeah, the Michael? interesting. Sorry, I, sorry, I, Mike. I, I didn't want to bust I, Mike because I, 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 I was talking to lawyers. Larry's description of the qualities that would make it, you know, that you need for a, a, a trial judge. Uh, <clears throat> but I think an appellate judge, the seat, kind of seat we're talking about, is yes. is that you, you want you want someone who who has litigated, you know, not just a you know a backroom business lawyer. Okay, um, uh, having. Uh, so backroom business lawyer, somebody who does uh, titles or to, you know, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, the, 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 the doesn't have to the actually has not argue been cases. In formal litigation, okay. you know. Uh, although I haven't been in formal litigation for quite a while, I, I, in in the earlier days I did plenty, so I'm qualified <laughs> under that standard. But but I, I, th I think that's real important that that uh, they, uh, but they don't they don't need that uh, you know uh, sort. Of Temperament management. They're not retail. Right, right. right. You, you, you assume that the, <laughs> they're sort of the things that blow up in a, in a courtroom but don't happen in the appellate court. So, but but uh, you, you, need, you need someone that has a broad experience in different areas of the law, but has been in, involved in litigation. Uh, you know. So, uh, Joe Ferretti moving back to uh, to West Virginia, maybe moving to Charleston would be a good idea in your in your mind. Well, that, that would no. No. <laughs> uh, that's a nice story. I, I, All right. Well, that's one less candidate. You know, I think I, I, 
I think the interesting thing about the Supreme Court is you would assume that a lower court, that the judge would come from a lower court, that that would be sort of like a stepping stone to get your feet wet mm -hmm. and to do that. And you would expect that, that one of those lower courts, that somebody would emerge as being a great candidate to go move up to the Supreme Court. But recently, in recent history, hasn't we've seen case. that hasn't okay. been the case, yeah. that sometimes these individuals come from the legislature. So you would see uh, like our Roger Hanshaw, a Charlie Trump, or somebody like that that's in the legislature legislature currently and and has legal background that could run and actually win a seat like that because they have that statewide recognition um so not necessarily do you see it coming from that lower court joe your thoughts well i i'm gonna ask a question here sure. uh, our well informed facebook crowd uh, is indicating that Charlie Trump has signaled an interest in this Supreme Court seat. Can we is, verify that? Is that from Charlie himself? Where, where did you get that information from? Uh, well, it's it's, uh, it's on our face. It's just on our feet. It could be rumor. I didn't don't see anything on Charlie's page, but I mean, he certainly is qualified, correct? Except uh, yeah, so, well, yeah. I mean, he's the kind of individual we're, we're speaking of. I think generally. Uh, look, Look, I, I've had my, my problems with, with Charlie Trump, and I've made it known to him directly. Uh, sometimes I thought as a head of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, uh, sometimes he advocated for laws that uh, I didn't like uh, and that I thought maybe even some of his clients wouldn't like. But uh, uh, yeah, he is well-versed in the law. Uh, he is... Uh, uh, has a broad base of experience, as, as Mike Carl was suggesting, is is a necessary requirement. Uh, he's done a lot of different things in the law, uh, and of course, he understands the political side of things too very well. He would be, uh, in my opinion, uh, an ideal candidate to be considered for the job if he's interested. Uh, and so, I'd be interested to know if, if if that rumor could be verified that maybe he is uh, expressing some interest. But it'd be somebody like him uh, for the job because it's uh, such an important one. We only have, you know, there's only five people walking the planet who can serve as a Supreme Court justice in the state of West Virginia. And uh, so you want to make sure it's somebody that does have that experience, knowledge, um, and, and even keeled. Approach have you, have you faced him in court? Joe? Charlie? No, yeah. I, I, not. Well, actually, you know, I must say, I think I currently have a case. Oh. Involving him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Joe, uh, for those that's not on our uh, Facebook chat page, uh, uh, Jeff Haddock says that he's going to be on Hoppy's show at 10 o'clock to announce his candidacy. Well, that's true. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, so my question that's would be then, what void does that leave in us? Huge Senate. void in the Senate. I mean, he, he, he's pretty much, uh, you know, I think him and Craig Blair get along, get along really, really well and, and work well together. What, what does that do to... Uh, Craig's um, pres Senate presence is he, you know, who does he rely on and, and who's the next candidate to come out of Morgan, Morgan County to take that Senate seat? Well, I think any organization that Charlie Trump goes to is going to be a benef beneficiary. Any organization that Charlie Trump leaves is going to be weakened because of it. He is, he's that strong a personality. He's that well, he always makes you feel like He's. I mean, when I'm in a room with him, I know he's the smartest man in the room. Yeah. He, he, yeah. It's, it's one but he never things. shows it. He never yeah. shows it. And I go back to when he was running for re-election for Senate. He was running with a candidate that had no reason at all to be in the field. That a candidate, the way he acted, the way he carried himself, the way he dressed, was could be totally dismissed. And the candidate was dismissed by us the interviewing him, most everyone else, with the exception of Charlie Trump. Charlie treated that guy like he was the most esteemed person imaginable. He did that in public. He did that in private. And I'll say this. I, I sat right next to Charlie during interims. We were in the yeah. Economic Development yeah. Committee meeting. Um, and my bill was actually on the, the table. And I, I told you, Senator Tarr... Um, wasn't exactly thrilled with it, so I, I thought it was dead in the water, but Charlie leaned over and gave me some suggestions, um, gave me the time, gave me the the ability to change that, and now I think we've got traction again, so I, I do give him credit for, for doing that 
just that, Bill. He, he doesn't matter who you are or where you yeah. are. And and it's, all, it's always professional. It's uh, with so, a great uh, demeanor. He's a, I, he's I think he's guy. a great candidate. Uh, but I yeah. would also put a Roger Hanshaw oh, in that absolutely. category as well as a, a level-headed, um, great individual that, that would meet all the criteria for a Supreme Court candidate. Anybody else you can think of throughout the state? That uh, what about uh, Judge Wilkes? Didn't he run uh, he, for that he, position he did. before? And uh, and uh, Chris is very much involved in mediation now and okay. <laughs> making probably pretty good money. Right. Uh, whether or not he'd be so willing be to update to go yeah. to Charleston, not, I don't know. But at one time, he very much wanted that position, Supreme Court. It's a um, it's an interesting thing to hear this if it's true uh, about. Um, Mr. Trump, because um, and this is Mr. Trump you like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Can we just say you like Trump? Just say I like Trump. Just like I like that. this. I, Trump. Use it. <laughs> <laughs> I would be sad if this Trump went to prison. <laughs> uh, uh, it's interesting because of the contrast between him and Senator Blair. That's what makes a good team. Yeah. Each of them has some things that maybe the other doesn't have. Um, you know, I've known Charles pretty well for quite a while. I never tried any cases against him because, if anything, we were on the same side of the V. Okay. But, um, you know, he uh, is very kind to people. He, he's mannerly and so forth. He maybe doesn't have the folksy appeal that Craig Blair would have. But... Craig Blair doesn't have some things uh, that Charlie Trump has, and the two of them can work together. I think he's got name recognition down south, with, with him being a senator down there for so long. I mean, I sure. think he could do... And well, and to the extent that people don't know who he is, he's, he's got the Lance Trump name. Yeah, yeah. No. Hey, don't dismiss that, Larry. I know, I'm not dismissing it. <laughs> All right, we got about 15 minutes left. Who has the next topic? We going to Mr. Height? I was going to build one. Yeah. Well, this debt ceiling discussion, uh, who came out the winner and who came out the loser? We had McCarthy that had a lot of stake. We had uh, President Biden that had a lot of stake. At the end result, who came out the winner? Mike Carl. Well, I think McCarthy. Uh, without, I mean, because Biden just uh, said no deal, no, no connection whatsoever, you know, no negotiation. And it was a... The, you know, it, it created a crisis at the last minute, and and even even though the, the Republicans didn't get everything they wanted, they got a lot, and and so I, I think McCarthy came out a big winner in in this deal. I, I would have to agree, and only because um, Biden went on record saying, "I will not yield." And it seems like he did. He did negotiate. Um, Maybe he forgot. It, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm just saying. I, he, he could um, But he made a big deal about he wasn't going to negotiate yeah. um, a, 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 at all. And it seems like that, that did happen. So if, if there is a winner and a loser, and I, I sort of feel like everybody wins in this, when, when nobody likes the deal, it's probably a good deal. Um, so, I, I, but if there is a loser, I would have to say it, it is Biden. And, and he, he was involved in, you know, several of these deals over, over his legislative career. Yeah. And, and as vice president, you know, so. The, the, to me, the leadership uh, shown by Joe Biden in the way that he handled this makes him the winner. And the reason I say that is McCarthy uh, was able to deliver a large portion of the Republican um, um, congregation, g g you know, con vote. the group, the, the, the caucus. Um, I don't know why I couldn't think of that word. Um, <laughs> and that's an interesting thing. And certainly McCarthy could, in the long run, win because Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene and the rest of those uh, crazies uh, in the Republican caucus well, have Ultra been conservatives, and their bluff has been called. What? I mean, they talked about holding Joe Biden hostage, and that they but got the AOC on. part was also just as mad. So the far right well, and the far left. We're both mad, which is what I think 
that's made that's, everybody happy. That's my point. I know yeah. Joe Ferrer is going to weigh in. I was going to say the moderates won, the extremes lost. Yeah. So, Joe? Uh, well, I, I agree with McCarthy being a winner because uh, up to this point, a lot of people doubted whether he had the wherewithal to, to lead. I think he has shown an ability, at least in this instance, to do that. I think the president uh, eventually came around to his campaign promises, which was to to be the great conciliator, conciliator, uh, whatever the word is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Like, it didn't sound like stubble <laughs> field now, Joe. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and, and to work across work across the aisle. I, I think the president eventually got around to that, and, and that kudos to him. I think a loser that we're overlooking here is Congressman Mooney, who continues to vote contrary to the other West Virginia representatives in the House and Senate. It should not be lost on us that both U.S. Senators representing West Virginia and Congresswoman Carol Miller voted for this bill. But there's Congressman Mooney voting against it. And he's by himself again, much like he was on the infrastructure bill. Joe, so did you really think you would vote for this, though? No, I, 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 I mean, well, I, I mean, I think he has to do a better calculation here of, of representing the state of West Virginia. The biggest slam against Mooney is that he's not a West Virginian. And if you and if you're voting against uh, or contrary to the way Shelley Moore Capito is voting, you got some explaining to do. And, uh, you know, polling shows he's running 40 points behind justice right now. So I, I'm wondering what his political handlers are telling him uh, in terms of these votes he's casting. I understand he's got allegiance to this Freedom Caucus, and they never vote for a debt ceiling raise. But the bottom line is he wants to be a U.S. senator, and he's going to have to show that he has some independence from that group and that he has more allegiance to West Virginia. And I think he missed an opportunity here. Well, I, th I think another interesting thing is you talk about the group that he, he falls within in the Republican Party. That's I said McCarthy was the winner in this, but McCarthy is the winner on a national stage. But within his own party, he made promises to, within his own party to get elected as speaker. And it seems like he may have gone back on those promises. So within his own party, he may not be the winner. And there are, there are people that are upset with this particular negotiation within the GOP. And I would say Mooney probably falls within that category. So it's, it'll be an interesting to see how McCarthy um, deals with that going forward within his own party. We should know the answer to that within the next few days, whether or not there's going to be a, uh, a real movement trying to uh, take him, uh, remove him from the leadership. I think the and Democrats will come around with him. Well, I, think, argue, I, I, I think don't think McCarthy showed a lot more leadership, yeah, at least sure on did. the national scene, than what. But I think the just, real winner here. I don't here. disagree. But how did how did that play within his own party with the people he made promises to to secure their votes for leader? But I think I would argue, Mike, that is a very small percent of the party. The sure. bulk, well, the bulk of the Republican Party was happy to see the direction he went. If but, they do not move to remove him as speaker, this loon caucus or whatever we call it out on the extreme right if they do not having insisted that they had that right and and especially with gates talking about hostage taking and so forth um then what's left for them is it all just talk no i, I don't mean, think they go down that road yeah. and if they, if they don't do it then boy oh boy i think some, somebody should just turn the mics off but if they now. make the move and fail then oh, they, then they, they absolutely did. Oh, absolutely I think, correct. I and don't that's think, why you shouldn't say you're going to do that. Yeah, I don't think uh, Mooney gets hurt by this at all. I think the big winner here is Mansion. The Mansion, the, this pipeline for for West Virginia, especially especially down south, is a big big deal. And I think this does. I think Mike has, has a point. This is a true testament that Mansion might. This might boost him in his Senate race. Yeah, I can see that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm surprised he hasn't announced one way or the other yet um, what he wants to particularly run for. But really, he, he, there's no opposition 
on on his side of the aisle, so why announce? I was going to say, there's no advantage at all for him to sure. announce now. Right. There are a lot of advantages and told off till January, early January. Yeah, I agree. All right, we're going to take our final break of the hour, and then we'll come back for the last segment. Thank you for joining Eastern Paynell Talk with Mike Hornby.